Professor, to the casual observer, it seems that many U.S. manufacturing jobs have been sent overseas. Is the casual observation correct, and is there cause for concern? The casual observation, in my opinion, is correct. But I think that um, there is not particularly cause for concern if we also take account of the import of certain manufacturing jobs to the United States, companies headquartered in other countries coming to the United States to set up manufacturing operations, creating new jobs and hiring Americans to do them. And also, if we think about the longer term net positive macroeconomic effects of this movement of uh, labor, which is a more efficient use of a key factor of production. So I think the answer to your question, the direct uh, answer is yes, the casual observer is correct, but I wouldn't then proceed to say this is a negative. What are some examples of companies coming to the U.S.? Well, they are legion. Uh, probably the ones that the casual observer might know best uh, are in the automobile industry. Uh, Nissan, Honda, Toyota, to take the Japanese companies as well as Mitsubishi, uh, BMW and Mercedes to take the German uh, companies, Hyundai, the Korean company, all of these are manufacturing in the United States. And you have companies in the medical field located outside the United States, headquartered outside the United States, who've come to the U.S. Consumer products companies have done that. You have to remember that some of the countries around the world have much higher labor costs than the United States. Japan and Germany are very uh, good cases in point. And so, even though there has been a net export of manufacturing jobs, it's combined with the export of some and the import of others. We tend, in the U.S., to export jobs in non-durable goods manufacturing. Um, components of computers, for example, uh, circuit boards, for example, shoes, for example. These are hardly manufactured at all in the United States. Countries like India and China and others are in the lead in these respects. That's a good thing from two points of view. One, the micro view from the firm. It reduces their production costs and operating costs. This means it reduces their product prices. Consumers have lower priced goods from which to choose. That's a good example of a micro effect. At the macro level, it creates jobs and economic development in countries that we otherwise have to provide sustenance, foreign aid, and other forms of support to, and it raises the standard of living in those countries. This same story has been happening in Mexico, in which 20 years ago, the Mexican manufacturing employee's wage compared to the American manufacturing employee's wage was about 10 percent. Today it's about 35 percent and rising because of the inflow of capital and uh, firms into Mexico. So I think it is the casual observer's correct judgment that manufacturing, firm, manufacturing jobs have been exported, but I think there are a lot, a lot of positive benefits to this that have to be taken account of to paint a complete picture. In terms of foreign firms locating here in the U.S., do these companies face any unique uh, human resource issues? Uh, well, they face uh, several of them. Um, try sometime explaining to a company that's come to the U.S. the terms exempt and non-exempt. These are in our labor laws. What they really mean is that if an employee, a covered employee works more than 40 hours in a week, they're entitled to overtime. And if they're not covered, they're not entitled to overtime. But instead of using plain English, covered and not covered, we say exempt, meaning they are exempt from the overtime laws, or non-exempt, meaning they are covered. You might imagine if you're a company that's headquartered in Japan or um, Ireland or Israel or Venezuela and you come to the United States, you might have some momentary confusion over what an exempt and a non-exempt employee is. Also, an area where any number of foreign-based firms operating in the U.S. have run into difficulties is in our discrimination laws. We outlaw discrimination in um, recruitment, selection, hiring, training, demotion, termination <clears throat> by age, sex, race, and national origin. In many other countries, those characteristics are accepted, widely used, so-called positive practices. If you go to Thailand and some other countries in Asia as examples, you see hiring for certain jobs listed as male and other jobs listed as female. You see age requirements that say you can be no older than 30 to apply for this particular job and so on. 
In the U.S., we do this quite differently. Those would be illegal practices. <clears throat> so there's another area where firms operating or headquartered outside the U.S. who come to the U.S. run into some pretty substantial difficulties. However, to be offset against that, we have a freer labor market than most other countries, so that companies located in European nations, for example, that come to the U.S., they can expand and contract their labor force. They can move and relocate their offices, plants, or facilities much more readily than they can do in Europe, and this gives them a certain advantage over operating at home and helps to explain why they're so eager to come to the U.S. So yes, there are some definite areas of conflict and concern around human resource management, foreign-based companies, but those have to be offset against these other opportunities.